there and welcome to the Agentic Voice Podcast. My name is Kristen Ruiz and I'm here with my lovely co-host, Dr. Geneva Main and Bex Van During. In today's episode, we are discussing moral injury and burnout in speech language pathology and gender affirming voice care. And don't forget to follow and subscribe to our channels on Instagram, YouTube, and your favorite podcast platform. And drop us a note. Let us know what you'd love to hear more about. So let me introduce you to Bex von During. They're a transmasculine, non-binary, voice-specialized speech pathologist in Seattle, Washington. They have specialized in gender-affirming care since 2015. In 2023, they developed the surgical protocol for gender-affirming voice surgeries in their role as clinical lead for Kaiser Permanente of Washington. Their experience includes interdisciplinary partnership with KPWA's Laryngology Voice Clinic. They've supported other hospital systems locally and along the West Coast in establishing protocols and eligibility criteria for gender affirming voice surgery. Bex is a mentor, public speaker, and professional trainer. They're a strong advocate for cultural competence and humility in working with transgender and gender diverse people, and they strive to improve health outcomes and health equity through patient centered care. So Bex, we're so happy to have you on the on the call today. Thanks so much for being here. I'm happy to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Yay, before we get into the nitty gritty of our very important conversation today, we usually start with our first segment, what's new and what's good, um, where we just share something that we're happy about, grateful about in our personal professional lives. And for me, I am sharing what I'm looking forward to, which is my upcoming um, vacation. Um, until then, I'm just trying to plow through finishing up some professional writing, which, you know, I do so much writing. Um, I don't love writing, um, but I'm always glad when that writing is done. <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of where I'm at right now. Just finished doing a bunch of writing and feeling good about that and looking forward to vacation. And what about you, Bex? Oh, I, I so I'm having a pretty wild year, actually, because I would oh. say that this is a highlight being here with you all today. Um, but I, I actually have a lot of st- really, really cool stuff coming up. Um, so the the Queer SLP podcast is going to be returning in spring 2024, mm-hmm. and we're coming back as a thruple. And I'm going to be um, joining Hector Miguel and Natalie White on the Queer SLP podcast and co-hosting that with them. Nice. Um, also, I've been doing a lot of work for Kaiser Permanente of Washington. Um, uh, next week, I'll be presenting at their adult gender affirming care Uh, talking about the services that we provide there at Kaiser. I've also um, been working together with colleagues along the West Coast for Kaiser, so NorCal, Southern California, and Oregon, um, working on creating an interregional collaboration between the uh, speech departments, trying to unite the care and unify the care that we're uh, providing to our gender health patients, um, because we found that there really is no cohesion in, um, in the patient experience. And so we're trying to really uh, bulk that up. So super excited about that. I've been volunteering for WPATH, which is the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, and um, working on a committee to set up a a voice and communication certification pathway. And then um, (laughs) I've got some (laughs) university engagements coming up at Western Washington and (laughs) Washington State University, or no, Eastern Washington University. And then in um, November of this year, I'm going to be going to Seoul, South Korea to sit on a, um, a panel um, talking about uh, the patient experience after uh, gender affirming voice surgeries. So that's going to be for the International Association for Trans Voice Surgeons. So that's a really very, exciting it's a, year. It's oh a my big God. year. <laughs> wow. Okay, I feel awesome. like you look too well rested for all that. <laughs> <laughs> And they have children at home too, yes? I do. I have a six-year-old turning seven in a month. Doing all that and keeping small humans alive, that's amazing. I also started a private practice, so, you know, I didn't even make the list. So wait, so, you know, being that you're going to be talking on a podcast or hosting a podcast, how often are you guys publishing um, episodes? We, you know, we, we have a pretty loose uh, schedule. So we, we had uh, sat down, made a nice format for, you know, uh, ideas and brainstorms. And then from there, we, we're just going to produce as we, as we get to it. So we're looking, yeah. I think, at um, something in April. We want to talk about caregiver roles in, um, in pediatric care, I believe. 
Nice. You know, because I think when Kristen and I started this, we were so ambitious. Um, we were like two episodes a month, you know, and it's a lot when you have other things going on. And I was just curious because you do have a pretty ambitious agenda, how often you'd be publishing. But I think, you know, as the important topics come up, you know, so we aim for like once a month, some months there's more, some months there's less. But I think we're settling into a nice groove with that. Yeah. Um, so how about you, Kristen? What's new? What's good? Well, first, I'm just sad for Bex because you're never going to win the underachievement award. I'm so sad that that's never going to be on your shelf. Never going to be you. Um, and Geneva, I think there must be some common like frequency because we've never celebrated something forward looking, but that was exactly what I had in mind. Oh, so, you know, just good energy. Um, so I'm actually celebrating this upcoming weekend because it's been um, it's been a pretty hectic month, um, maybe running at full steam a little bit longer than than I intended. I'm trying to get things a little bit more balanced so it's not so like, you know, excessively busy and then, you know, you drop of just exhaustion. So I'm trying to balance that out, but this didn't do that so much this month. So this coming weekend, I have like play dates all uh, a Saturday and Sunday. So we're going to be visiting um, some friends. We're singing with some friends that we haven't sung with in years. So there's going to be music and joy and just delicious communication and food and all of those things. So i um, going to unplug this week and get some like energy enriching. Uh, it's an energy enriching weekend, I think, coming up. So that's what I'm looking forward to. Yay. It's nice to have stuff to look forward to. Yeah. So let's jump into our our segment here. In this segment, we do like to highlight personal stories, research findings, you know, important issues in our field. And so in this segment, what we want to do is we want to be thoughtful about the many layers involved in gender affirming voice care. You know, voice, language, and communication, they're all so deeply connected to one's identity and culture. And we just here at the podcast want to be sensitive to the nuances involved, you know, and moving forward with cultural humility, um, as we're here really to seek to learn to understand. And uh, we're just really grateful, Bex, to have this opportunity to speak with you. Thank you for the opportunity. Nice. So like you and I met for the first time at Fall Voice, um, well, in person, we had spoken yes. before on the um, Forward Focus Journal Club. Um, and had some email exchanges, but you're tall, huh? I was like surprised. <laughs> <laughs> I am tall, although it's it, it, maybe my hair gives me a little bit more. So <laughs> I have shrunk. I got pretty close to six foot, and I've been shrinking over the last uh, say I was, decade. <laughs> I was so surprised. I was like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> I know things you can't tell when you're looking I'm through. Big. Me. I'm a big person. <laughs> German farmers where uh, my lineage is German farming so <laughs> and so I had found out that you got an ASHA Innovator Award um, back in the fall congratulations can you tell us a little bit more about the work that you were leading as an innovator um, you know a lot of um, a lot of the way that I wanted to drive um, that conversation about innovation and SLP was um, talking about how you can take small steps that have large impact. And so, you know, one of the first things that happened when I started at Kaiser Permanente was, and it was actually a different company at the time, but we had um, we had these templates that we were using in our Epic and our um, electronic medical records that um, just kind of needed updates. I, you know, I kept finding myself just re rewording things and went to my boss and said, hey, how about if we, you know, if I become an editor on these and start updating them? And, um, and from there, I, I really took the lead on being able to uh, edit all of the templates that our entire um, uh, department uses. And through that, I was able to create a lot more cultural competence for Kaiser uh, by, by being one of the first departments where we use people's names um, rather than their insured names, their, the name that they use in public. Um, by making sure that people had access to their pronouns in the records before uh, the database would pull that in. Um, and then just kind of, uh, you know, trying to keep your, your ear to the ground in whatever work that you're in and trying to find places where equity and um, diversity and inclusion can be improved. Because that, I think, is, you know, when you're working especially for a large corporation or a large company, um, you know, this stuff wasn't baked in from the beginning. And I always say that diversity and um, DEIB 
be needs to be baked in from the beginning. And if it isn't, you're fixing it forever. And so I think a lot, I think I was nominated, I was nominated by Maura Filipino. Um, and she did that because she knew how much work I had been doing at, at Kaiser to improve the DEIB um, aspect for the clients and also for the providers who were working there. Yes, um, I like that you said when DEI is not baked in from the beginning, you're fixing it forever. Um, so part of the things, one of the things that I think about a lot when it comes to trauma informed care is when you need to repair, right? You try to create safe environments. Um, and that's if you have the intention of creating a safe environment. Some people don't even think about that. But like, um, even though you try and create a safe environment, sometimes you need to repair. And in instances um, where you might have a homogenous field, for example, <laughs> that doesn't um, take into consideration, you know, the diversity of, of humankind, you're forever trying to fix what wasn't put in from the beginning. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more. Fixing the numerous issues within our field is on a lot of SLPs minds right now. And I love the Instagram post you created that fixing SLP was going to be through doing that DEI work and fixing moral injury and SLP. So can you tell us a little bit more about what you mean by that? I mean, I'm familiar with the term moral injury, but I don't think necessarily in the context that you're using it. So can you flesh that out for us? Absolutely. I learned about uh, the concept of moral injury in healthcare about two years ago, but it was starting to really come to fame um, just before the pandemic. And um, what was happening was physicians were complaining about not having enough time with their patients, mm -hmm. having to put in um, prescription requests numerous times, referral requests numerous times, knowing exactly what it was that the patient needed, doing everything that they needed to do to get those services for the patient, but there were still structural, structural um, barriers that were preventing these providers from providing the care that they knew was best for their patients. And, um, and I really thought about that as a speech pathologist at, at Kaiser, which is, you know, I, I have found to be a really wonderful place to work. I've been there for 15 years. I love it there. Um, but we see um, these moral injuries throughout our experiences as speech pathologists. Um, and so I started to dig into that uh, information. And the biggest thing that I had learned from that was that it, it, it had stemmed from the 1970s after soldiers were coming back from Vietnam War and they were trying to treat these soldiers for PTSD. And it turned out that they were using the wrong cure because it was the wrong disease. And then they were starting to discover that these soldiers were actually being impacted by moral injury. And what was happening was their, um, their leadership was having them um, to do things that they knew was wrong, or they were witnessing things that they were doing, or sorry, witnessing things that were wrong. I and, think it's conscience, you're saying. And it was starting to impact their conscience. Mm. And, um, and some of them were feeling a great deal of shame, which is really, really unhealthy response. And then some were feeling guilt, which is a more healthy response. Because if you feel guilt, then you, um, then you can still tap into that moral compass that you have. And then there's something that you can do to treat that, that illness and that injury. And so I started thinking about that in speech pathology, when I think about these enormous caseloads that people have. You know, um, uh, speech pathologists in the school district talk about how the majority of their caseload is a single articulation um, error. And so they're working with only our kids. And then they see the kid that has AAC device that really needs more attention. But the, the single articulation kids are getting more. Um, I think about it when I see a stroke patient and they come in and they, um, you know, I had one who was fully employed his whole life, really good job. And he, um, after my appointment with him, he was going to the food pantry to go get food because he was so financially destroyed by his stroke that he couldn't afford food. And that was a moral injury. And so the people who talk about moral injury in healthcare have started to talk about not calling them social determinants of health, but actually calling them moral determinants of health. Hmm. And that um, the what a moral injury is, you can either be um, an agent of a moral injury. So you can act it, you can mm -hmm. be the witness to it, or you can be the victim of it. And mm -hmm. so we even just think about like seeing a loved one go through a really, uh, really bad experience through the hospital and you know what they need. You're saying I, or, or maybe you're, you know, like I was learning from the, um, 
uh, Confronting Anti-Black Racism and Communication Sciences Disorder from Credits Institute, that, um, you know, Black parents have to take their children to the speech pathologist three years longer before they get an um, ASD diagnosis. That's that's a, an actual injury. And so you can have these really firm injuries or you can have these traces of them that build up and create a bigger um, internal problem that then can lead to burnout. And the problem- never, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm jumping on you, but I had never thought about it in, in those terms. I remember I started my career in elementary school in Connecticut. And I remember thinking about the inequity of how certain students got services and the amount of services and other students didn't. And as a black clinician, it was hard for me to witness, you know, um, white students with with parents advocating, getting what they need, they needed and wanted for their children. And then, you know, maybe a poor minority student, not having someone to advocate other than me, the clinician, um, and then my recommendation dismissed because unless there's a family or a parent advocate there, um, students don't get necessarily get what they need. They get what the district is willing to provide, which is oftentimes less. And when the, when the socioeconomic state of the family is that you have to have two or three jobs and you can't co go to those meetings, you don't have anybody there advocating for you. I had never considered that as a moral injury, but I'm, I'm liking the way that you're explaining that and articulating that. Mm -hmm. um, and so the uh, as far as moral injury is concerned, the research that I had done is that um, itinerant staff are more likely to experience moral injury. And um, and that is because they're more likely to travel between schools and they'll see the inequities between schools. So they'll walk into one school and have to go through, you know, a metal detector and they're sitting in a in a closet working with five kids and then they go to another school that doesn't have any of those things and you have a window in your office and you're working with two kids and um you know you know what these kids need but there's too many things getting in the way and not allowing you to do what's what you know to be right and the flip side of that is when you have staff saying but well, you're the clinician why doesn't this person get this and that sometimes you can even be blamed as the clinician for someone not getting what other people think they deserve and they don't know the power structures that are in place to keep even your recommendations from being heard in that kind of a setting so it is i wonder how i survived that honestly um all, i'm still in this profession you know i've definitely had my my uh bouts of burnout and stress for sure um and i think about sometimes you see slps post on social media and you're like, yeah, I could, that resonates with me, but that's not thankfully the place that I'm in now. And I could not tell you how I got from point A to point B. I got from point A to point B by learning about moral injury actually, <clears throat> because it helped me so much to understand that my moral compass was still intact and yeah. that I was being harmed witnessing all of these social determinants of health um, impacting my clients. And um, yeah, some other some other data that I had learned was, you know, ASHA does uh, surveys of, of speech pathologists, you know, 10% of outpatient clinicians say that they are asked to do something that they do not feel that they are trained to do. That's a moral injury. It was mm -hmm. almost, I think the number was about 25% of people uh, working in um, SNFs report being um, told to do something, um, to do a test or a treatment that they did not find appropriate, but still being forced to do it. So these are these are those uh, residue, moral injury residue that builds up to burnout. And the, the difference between moral injury and burnout is that burnout actually has a definition. And that definition is that um, the workplace stress is not well managed by you. Well, mm. Mm. There's only so much stress management that you can do. There's so much yoga you can do so much, you know, maybe you give me a pizza party every now and then, but that's not going to fix the bigger problems. Right. And so, um, so the solutions to burnout, that's why I mentioned the stuff after the Vietnam war, the solutions to burnout do help burnout, but they don't help moral injury. Moral injury requires a collaborative approach between clinicians, administrators, politicians, and they actually do have advice. And the the person who does moral injury um, podcast, I wish I could remember the name, I'll send it to you when I'm done, mm -hmm. um, actually gets invited to go speak to healthcare systems. And she always says, 
Will you actually do any of the suggestions that I'm bringing in? And if you have no plans to ch make any changes, I'm not coming to speak to your group. Well, yes, please do send us the name and we'll put Moral that, matters. We'll put that in um, the show notes so people can link to it. And, you know, since you've said what you've said, you know, now I think that maybe I'm on the other side of um, burnout and moral injury because the doctorate that I did was specializing in trauma and its applications to communication disorders. And now my advocacy is so advocacy is so much for trauma informed principles in um, in our in our national organization in all the settings that we work in. And so probably that gives me a sense of purpose um, and direction and uh, efficacy. Whereas when I was just feeling the injury, it was like, I felt like I couldn't do anything about it. Ah, so this was a, a, a big little conversation for me. <laughs> Thank you for that. My pleasure. Can you also tell us a little bit about your work uh, in as a gender affirming voice and communication specialist and yeah. trans health and neurodiversity advocate? Absolutely. So um, as, as clinical lead, I'm the, I, I was asked uh, in about 2015 if I wanted to put together the gender affirming voice uh, services and um, trained everybody there and um, started to become increasingly interested in it. And then as time went by, I became better and better at it and got more and more clients um, referred to me. And so I started becoming kind of the specialist there. Um, as, a, as a trainer, what I can say is that when I when I've gone to so many gender affirming trainings, the or even just talks, research talks, the thing that always stands out to me is that it always feels like there's a separation between the actual voice work and the understanding of the community. And um, and I was I grew increasingly frustrated um, going to talks and just hearing about formant frequencies and pitch and, you know, but, but ne never really talking about the actual people that, um, that this care is serving and the, and the life-saving nature of it. Um, and so often I hear it talked about like, well, you know, you just need to teach people acoustic assumptions and the programmatic approach, and then you send them on their way and they're, you know, but the, but the research shows that people do leave treatment fairly satisfied, but don't have strong long-term outcomes from that. And so I always say in gender affirming care, you can teach a person to change their voice, to modify their voice, but how do you teach them to like that voice and to make, to feel like it's actually theirs and that they're not an imposter and um, imposter syndrome is really strong in the in the gender affirming community because um, a lot of the the ways that we speak, um, the gendered ways that we speak, are trained to us in childhood. But um, but those gender aspects weren't offered to us uh, if we were assigned the wrong gender at birth, and so we didn't have access to that. And so overcoming the imposter syndrome can take a long time because you feel so fake or some people feel so fake. Some people don't, but, um, but a lot of what I've been learning over the years and through my own lived experience is to me, dysphoria has the wrong definition. Dysphoria is a strong discomfort with your gender at birth or whatever. Um, but, but for me, dysphoria is transphobia. And, um, and the, the only time that I felt dysphoric was when I was afraid to express my gender outside of the binary norm. And that was transphobia making me afraid of that. And so I've, I've never felt dysphoric in my body until I started to express my gender differently. You know, I can, at the risk of oversimplifying this um, very complex issue, uh, I'm going to like take a chance with my own vulnerability um, and think about the times when I've been misgendered. Um, first, as a black woman who wears my hair short for like most of my young adult life, and I've had people say, are you a boy or a girl? And like, you know, um, have people question what I believe my identification is, she, her, female, cisgender female because I choose to wear my hair short, I can relate to that sense of, um, I think I can, you know, that's the, the closest experience I have to it of, um, of being misgendered. I, 
appreciate your vulnerability. And to be totally honest with you, I, I often say that I was cis until I wasn't cis. And I, I was misgendered my entire life. And mm -hmm. I got that question. I, you know, as a teenager, I remember like trying to like throw my ponytail, like, you see my ponytail? Because I was so afraid of getting misgendered at any given moment. Yeah. I've been confronted in num numerous bathrooms throughout my life for being in the wrong bathroom. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that was before I cut my hair short. And yeah. that was when I finally was like, you know, I'm cutting my hair short. Like I can't go to the bathroom with long hair and boobs. <laughs> Sorry. I said it. <laughs> so like what, what's stopping me from feeling good in my body mm -hmm. when it was already happening. And that experience of getting misgendered is, is actually very true. And Dr. Main, I would actually say that I, I appreciate that you took that time to reflect on those experiences because when, um, when we think about pronouns, we often, you know, if we're providing clinical care, we we're very good about asking people that we perceive as transgender for their pronouns, but we don't ask um, people that we perceive as cisgender for their pronouns. And it's really important to remember that everybody has a gender and that um, as a look, uh, Vaid Menon says that um, every woman is different, every man is different, and every non-binary person is different. And they actually, it's a much better quote than that. But um, but it really is, I, I think it is important for every person um, to really explore their experience with gender and, um, and, and take that time to understand those moments that, you know, something felt really not in alignment. I love the way you express that. Um, and it's so funny because I don't know if it was your, I follow a couple of different Instagram pages uh, where people talk about gender affirming uh, care. And someone had posted, I don't remember who it was, um, that you can't tell someone's gender by looking at them. And that really resonated with me because of the uh, experiences that I had had in the past. And um, it just makes me think of Beyonce you know, she talked about Becky with the good hair. <laughs> I knew you're like Rebecca. Thanks. <laughs> I was Becky in childhood. <laughs> Coming full circle. <laughs> so silly. But yeah, um, just to bring some levity into this topic. But, you know, um, you you cannot tell someone's gender by looking at them. And I appreciate you saying that. It's not just transgender people who you need to ask. Who their pronouns are you need to ask everybody and they might not be transgender yet right that's been the really nice thing about working at kaiser i've been there for just over 15 years and so i've seen i've seen clients come through the door at two and three years old come in for a learning test at six years old come back for another learning test at 13 years old and um and now at 13 they have new pronouns and, you know, we look back at all the other stuff and you wonder like, okay, this was a kid who was thinking about it probably the last time they interacted with our department and how safe did we make them feel and how affirmed did we make, um, how affirmed did we make them feel as they were coming in and, and, you know, we, we start getting their pronouns now when they're 13, but I, I ask every patient now, I introduce myself with my pronouns. I ask every patient they usually look at me like I'm growing two heads, but it's what we got to do. Yeah, I definitely think it's a good practice. You did ask me also about um, uh, neurodivergent um, affirming care. And one thing I will say is that there are exceptionally high rates of ADHD and autism in the transgender community. So, um, so knowing how to provide multi-modality instruction um, is really helpful for that community. You can't just come in with a bunch of analogies. You know, I, I often say in voice care, the best the best voice teacher is get comes up with the best analogies for that person, right? Um, but but the, that's not always the best way to do that care. And so you really have to be able to pay attention to that person's learning style and really adapt your work. Um, I try to I learn from Ruchi Capilla and um, have little like pop, you know, the packing bubbles for people to pop and little fidgets. I offer fidgets for people. I'll also say, you know, if you have any stems that make you feel comfortable while we're doing our work, please feel free to use, um, use your stems. Um, this is a stem affirming environment. <laughs> no, I was um, thinking uh, just to kind of 
uh, shift the topic a little bit about your work with gender affirming voice surgery protocols. So tell us a little bit about that and how you got involved with that. Ah, the um, the Washington Health Authority uh, said that any services that are provided to one community gets every community gets them. And so um, we have a laryngologist on staff, Dr. Stephen Sheff. He's an incredible surgeon. Um, wanted to start doing this care and um, put together a pilot program. We created the surgical protocols for who gets to um, who gets to have these services or who gets to have the surgery. So we um, honestly just had to dig through as much research as I could. But I would say it was extremely difficult to find uh, post-operative and pre-operative care instructions. We really, truthfully, I had to build so much of it on my own. And now as I'm reading more and more and more um, articles are being written about these surgeries, there is better uh, post-operative care advice. But a lot of it I was having to figure out on my own. Um, well, and with, with my colleagues. I mean, I was often collaborating and asking, of course, but we had to develop those on our own. Um, but now that's that's the beauty of this interregional collaboration that we're doing with Kaiser. Um, Southern California and I think Northern California are also about to start, I think I'm allowed to say this, um, phonosurgeries. Uh, they're, they're looking into them. And um, and it was it's really nice because the people down down south were able to reach out to me and I was able to send them everything that I had. So every preoperative, every postoperative protocol, um, you know, any strategies that I had learned along the way. Yeah. Are there any strategies or protocols that stand out to you as like that that really delighted you to be able to get those on board? You know, actually, the thing that was uh, that people are bumping into the most is so many surgeons will set a pitch requirement. And so they'll say that a person can only receive the surgery if they cannot achieve 150 Hertz or 155 Hertz. Um, but there's a lot of research out there that says that a, a, a person's pitch needs to be at about 185 to be assumed female. And um, so that number by itself is a bit off. But then it, there's also that idea that, okay, well, if a person can produce that sound for one minute or five minutes, that's not what they, what they can do all the time. Um, so many of my clients that I'm working with can read in a perfect voice. But as soon as we move from um, reading to speaking, the, their voice instantly shifts back to uh, having the older dynamics. It makes me think of tessitura, you know, just because you can do it for a short period of time doesn't mean you can do it <laughs> the whole time. <laughs> Range and tessitura live very differently in yes. the experience of singing. Yes. <laughs> very cool. Um, so uh, I, you know, as we're wrapping up this segment, I'm thinking the big takeaway for me is how important it is. I'm watching you as you're answering and talking. And just like when you're living in your purpose and you, um, your, your purpose and your work is aligned with your values and your goals, how just good that makes people feel. <laughs> like I can see that you're, you're shining, you're glowing, you're, you, you're feeling good about what you're doing. And I would wish that for every SLP. And I think that is something to think about as a field, our experiences with moral injury and burnout and what it would take for us to um, all be feeling this experience of being in a purpose and being aligned with what it is that we want to be doing, you know? It really honestly helps that I have a management team that allows me autonomy and allows me space and time to work on projects that are aligned with my goals, but ultimately Kaiser's goals. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, we, we do our meetings during lunchtime We're you know, it's not technically paid time that we're doing our meetings to do these things, but you know, it's, it's for the good of the patient. And so the, the happiest employees are the ones who can create their own job. Yes. Yeah. That's nice. Well, this work just seems like the epitome of patient care of what do they need? And it really is. I mean, I come from the singer world, so we talk a little more fluffy sometimes, but I mean, it just seems like an act of love to be able to give to present a space that's safe and speaks to their their value and who they are in the world and 
that's good work to be a part of. Yeah. And when you can do it properly, you can align like their cultural things too. So, you know, some, some aspects of a feminine perceived voice is that there's more of a legato pattern and not a staccato pattern. But, you know, I, I work with Asian clients who speak, who speak monosyllabic and uh, first languages. And so they have a more staccato pattern in their accent. So being able to be, um, to understand a person's intersectionalities and understand that they have, um, that they might have a little bit of an accent, they might not want to get rid of that accent. So what should, what should their voice sound like? with that accent. And so really being able to um, use metatherapy techniques about, um, you know, turning them into their own voice clinicians so that they can listen, uh, pick up strategies from their communities and bring them into themselves. Because I sound like my friends. And ultimately, I always tell my clients, you, you're not supposed to sound like me. <laughs> I'm 43 years old, transmasculine. <laughs> you're not supposed to sound like me. <laughs> nice. I love yeah, that empowerment and speaking of empowerment, let's go into our next segment. Um, so in this segment, we love to feature a practice that facilitates um, agency and freedom of voice. So do you have a specific thing that you would like to share with our listeners today? Yeah. Um, we recently at forward focus read an article by uh, Dr. Ava Van Leer about um, homework adherence and voice. And um, the strategy that I've really taken off with is this idea around um, people's adherence to homework is best improved when they can see themselves being successful with something. And so if you're trying to learn something, um, the best thing to do is to record yourself doing it and doing it correctly and watch yourself doing it. And then using those videos or list those audio clips to, uh, to support your homework and um, learning from yourself rather than learning from someone else. Because if somebody sees me um, on a video doing forward focus resonance, um, the, they might just go, well, of course you can. You've been doing it for 20 years. Um, you know, as opposed to I'm brand new at this. I don't know how to do this. And so um, I've really taken that and started to just get scared a little bit and actually just play audio samples back with people, have them listen, see if we can figure out the spectrogram together, see if we can figure out where your formant frequencies are and, um, and, and really try to look at like the amplitude of the sound wave and you've got too much loudness there. Let's see if we can bring that down and teaching people to use um, the technology that's available to them um, in, uh, in a safe way because I'm learning it too. Um, at Kaiser, so much of the time we just used our ears and then in my private practice, I have a lot more tools because I've purchased them, um, a lot more tools at my disposal. So I'm, I'm taking some risks now and I'm teaching people to use the software. And so I think learning from yourself and then learning from the clinician and really um, having the clinician ask you, what did you do? How did you create that? How did that feel? How did that sound? Um, really helps people um, understand that that I'm not in charge of their voice, that they're in charge of their own voice and I'm their co-pilot. To me, it reminds me of the practice of self-reflection. Um, when you can like chat down your thoughts and listen to them, in this case, record your voice and listen to it, then you're reflecting back, do I like the way this sounds? Um, what tools can I have to improve? You know, what's hard about it for me, you know, and this is an application that I've had to do with singing voice, um, is building the routine in, into my daily routine. That's the part I think that's a little bit hard, but that's a great uh, agent of practice. Thank you for sharing that one. We can also put that article in the, in the show notes, the Ava Van Leer one. I'll send that to you because she actually also recommends in that article really setting up, okay, when are you going to do this? Ah, nice. Tether, trying to tether that activity to something you're already doing. So habit stacking. Cool. We can put them both in, in the show notes. Yeah. Um, what I was going to say also was that I love the idea of getting on the same side of the table as the client, the student, the same, like whatever, whoever you're working with and figuring it out together. And um, I think that there's, there's an inner intuition that sometimes gets shut down. And so those questions that you just presented are a way to kind of awaken that 
that embodied knowledge, the somatic knowledge, the, the intuition that comes from, from experiential learning. So, so that's great. Get on the same side of the table and figure it out together. As opposed to I have all the answers, you take it. I found that it also helps um, with intra rater reliability because um, when we actually sit down and listen to it together and talk about it, it's interesting what can come back sometimes. A person might come back and go, you know, I, I loved it yesterday, but today I listened to it and it was terrible. And I'm like, you're a different person today. What happened this morning? And so it, it really affords us the opportunity to understand that the way that we respond to the things that we create um, can really feel different differently at any given point. And um, that kind of agency, I think, is what makes a person a better voice clinician for themselves. Yes, I'm excited to read these articles. This conversation has been awesome. I don't know if there's any last um, nuggets that you'd want to share with us. Um, if not, we can do our closing. I think my um, my last nuggets are to um, to remember that um, that transphobia is pervasive, that it's strong within the individuals themselves. And that when you're working with a, gen, uh, a transgender or gender diverse client, that they, they might be experiencing their own internalized um, transphobia, that there's a lot of trauma associated with that. And that um, you, you really have to be prepared to put on your counseling hat a little bit, but also really learn how to shift from the counseling to the actual work. And my favorite thing to say when somebody comes in and they're really upset and I can feel their session heading in that counseling direction and we're not going to get any work done today. My favorite thing, and I would like to just give this to anybody, is to say, I'm so glad that you're here and I know that you came here for a reason. Let's work on that. And that almost always will shift the conversation to the thing the, per the person actually came for. Nice. Well, in this episode, we discussed moral injury and burnout in speech language pathology and gender affirming voice care with Bex von During. If you enjoyed today's content, I encourage you to tune in, share it with your friends, and don't forget to leave a review or comment so that we know what you do and don't like. Your engagement helps our podcast grow. Until next time, take care.